What is up, internets? Welcome to Self-Defense from All Angles, the podcast where we try to expand the conversation surrounding self-defense. I'm your host, Randy King, owner of 8020 Conflict Management Strategies. This week, we talk with Chris Little. He's an Edmonton-based personal trainer whom I love. I love his thought process. I love how he analyzes the world. This week, we talk about a whole bunch of different topics like being client first in your training, bullying, and the differences between social and asocial bullying. We also talk about the mindset of generating a strong community to keep you motivated throughout all of your hardships. And don't forget to join us on the Patreon portion where Chris tells us a story about him being at a house party where he made a bunch of pretty funny mistakes, but there's some lessons in there about situational awareness and self-awareness, which is a huge part of Chris's message. If you, your organization, or your company are looking for more information when it comes to proactive self-defense that is education driven. I'm available for workshops, seminars, and keynote speeches for your group. Now let's get to the show. All right, everyone, let's welcome to the show for the first time, Chris. Chris, thank you for being on the show. Thanks so much for having me, Randy. I've been looking forward to this all week. This is a treat. If you haven't listened already, go check out the Lifestyle Chase with yours truly on it. Chris has a amazing show. It has a jillion episodes. I love Chris. I, I like his energy. I like his attitude. I really like the way he looks at the world. I don't have a lack of trainers I could have brought on the show. I chose Chris specifically because I really enjoy his worldview and his energy. So if that wasn't clear in the episode with him. It's definitely clear as he's the only trainer this season on the show. So Chris, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself? I primarily am a personal trainer based in Edmonton. I also do some work doing some online coaching under a team fitness based out of Michigan. And through there, I train people all over the U S and I produce the podcast for a team fitness. I also do some work for Beverly Simpson fitness based in New York, where I produce that podcast, do a little bit of direction with the media that is published and just part of a team. I'm in the social media space locally contracting, creating content, doing videography. So I wear a lot of hats. I take a lot of pride in working with people and helping them be the best version of themselves. And as we had talked about prior, I host a podcast called The Lifestyle Chase. I've had some amazing conversations with some really cool people, both inside and outside of the fitness industry. Yeah, that basically encapsulates everything that I'm about right now. We live in the same city, but I kind of got introduced to you through social media. We know some similar people. Everybody shares everybody. It's really cool. I think that's a pretty cool tribe of people that like up share everyone, which I love. Your hustle on your lifestyle chase is crazy. You've done so many episodes. I haven't stuck to one format as, long, as even close to as many episodes as you've done. But getting into this show, because we're primarily a self-defense show, self-defense small angles, we want to get as many opinions as possible about self-defense in general. So we'll start off with the standard question of what is your definition of self-defense? The really great thing is if people go and they listen to our episode together, the way you defined self-defense was something that I really aligned with in just we're kind of avoiding conflict. Like we're trying to communicate in such a way that reasons to need to defend yourself don't come up. So I look at self-defense as, as like intricate high level communication and standing true to our values. If you are a values oriented human being who does things with integrity, it's more likely that people are going to have an understanding of why you do what you do. They won't necessarily have to agree with everything, but they're going to understand where you're coming from and you're less likely to offend anybody by doing something out of malice. So that's kind of my angle at it. I'm not really like, nobody really looks at me and thinks, oh, a tough guy. Like I am more known for being approachable. I can certainly lift heavy and there's lots of strong attributes to me, but I'm definitely more of a teddy bear. So I, I definitely lean more towards what can we do to avoid any kind of need to defend ourselves? Because as many people who listen to the show will have experienced, it's never really like the best way to go to like be looking for conflict, to be looking for situations that you need to defend yourself because we only get so many chances until we're at our last straw. So you self-identified as a teddy bear. With that, have you found yourself in many bad situations or has that kind Kind of personality and worldview helped you avoid most bad situations? I would say I have found myself in some, some interesting situations. Sure. One thing that comes to mind is like I work with some, some younger clients 
who get like kind of picked on at school. And I think about them when it comes to my earliest encounters with any kind of bullying or violence or fighting or anything like that. And most of the time when I kind of just stood my ground once, then I avoided conflict. Or when I spoke very clearly, then I avoided conflict. But the first example that comes to mind for for my memory, there was a kid on the school bus that was just like licking his finger, reaching over the seat. And he was like gonna poke me with his finger with spit all over it. And it was kind of getting on my nerves. And it just got to a point where I just like, grabbed his hand and I twisted and I was like, don't ever do that again. And he, he never did it again. Like we rode the school bus for like 10 more years together, something like that never happened again. And it was just being able to sort of handle that kind of conflict directly was helpful. And just through the different areas that I've worked in and lived, there's oftentimes been like sketchy situations where somebody like it could be somebody that was intoxicated or somebody that just wasn't all there would spark something that could turn into something pretty significant or it would make threats. There was an instance where I was in a small rural Alberta town and somebody actually had a gun. And so it was just like kind of going through my faculties of like, like what is in my control in this situation? And I knew that I don't know how to disarm somebody, right. but I knew that I knew how to get the hell out of there as fast as possible. I think I've been lucky that my instincts have taken over my ego more often than not, uh, but there have been some situations where it's a battle because you don't want someone to make you look bad or make you look like you're not capable of, of defending yourself. But for the most part, I would say that instincts have won. So let's give our international listeners a minute to comprehend that Canadians also have guns sometimes because they might not know that. And then going forward, I love your synopsis of instinct over ego. And when you describe the bullying on the bus, so bullying, like all types of violence, comes in kind of two flavors, social and predatory. So bullies that bully you in front of people are social bullies and exactly what you did, the dominance game, should de-escalate that. Bullies that bully in private are predators and that the de-escalation may not be the same. So I think that's important for the listeners to understand is that the motivation behind the violence is almost always more important than the actual violence being committed. Why are they doing it is more important than what they're doing. So I love that you had the, the forethought to know that, you know, if, oh, if I just, you know, stand up to this person, then they're going to stop. But there's a blanket statement out there where people are like, oh, if you just stand up to bullies, they're just scared or whatever. Not always. If your bullies waiting for everybody to leave and then bullying you, you're, you might be in a different situation. Going to the ego. I want to talk on that because it does seem like you have your ego very in check. You're very, you're very self-aware. You're giving, you know who you are as a person and at a much younger age than I achieved that. So what parts of your life gave you the experience, the positive reinforcement, the, the reasoning to understand that your ego shouldn't call the shots? If I was to trace it back as early as possible, I would say it's like kind of the lessons that my parents instilled in me. There's one that really stands out. I was with my dad. We were walking through the bay and there was a kid that I went to school with that was walking around and they were like, hey, Chris. And like, I didn't really talk to them at school. And so I just kind of felt like I, I felt this sense of entitlement where I didn't have to say hi to people that I didn't talk to. And my dad like took me aside and he was like, you say hi to people that say hi to you. It doesn't matter what else is going on. You need to say hi to them. And that kind of like that really stuck with me. So it made me start to understand like there's a lot more to the communities that I'm a part of and a lot more to the interactions that I have than just me. There's more going on than just me. And so that was like the first kind of like moment where I started to kind of be like, okay, okay. Start paying attention to how your actions impact other people. And with that said, like I've never been a perfect person. There's always been little flaws and quirks and things that I've been working on. But as I got older, I had, well, I actually got recognized for a leadership award in the local community about three times, a couple of times through the church that I was involved with and once through the school that I was going to. And through that, I got to go to some uh, leadership camps. So we'd spend like the whole weekend or something learning how to be a better leader through like your youth. Like I was probably in like age 12 to 14 or something during this period. 
period of time. Then I had the opportunity to be a camp counselor from age like 14 to 18 or so. My actions had like a ripple effect that were clearly evident in that if I showed up in a way that wasn't good, I would see that show up in the kids that I was working with. So it's just like all these sort of tests where it makes it abundantly clear the impact that you have on people. Right. And as I would kind of learn lessons, I would be like, okay, if I do something wrong, another person's going to pick up on this. Another layer of experience for me was when I was in, I think it was grade 12, I had quite a few uh, spares. So the guidance counselor set me up to mentor a bunch of kids in uh, grade six in like the schools that went into my high school. And so it was just like a bunch of young boys and I got to kind of prepare them for what was coming. They're grade six, coming to grade seven. And a lot of the first things that often came to mind with preparedness was peer pressure around drugs and alcohol because like that was a thing. I had a lot of young peers and stuff that got like alcohol poisoning in like grade seven or something. Oh jeez, okay. Like I remember a kid getting dragged out of the class like foam coming out of his mouth. And then I just, I kind of, since a young age, branded myself as this person that was concerned for the well being of other people. And obviously, as I got older, I would have like my party phase and I would do all these different things that kind of help a person learn who they are. But yeah, just like long story short, it's these environments and these opportunities, these responsibilities and like identities that I took on as being a leader from a young age that have certainly instilled in me why I am the way I am. I look back at old Facebook memories. I'm preaching the same things back then as I do today on my Instagram. I'm like, oh man, I'm consistent at least. So it's, it's uh, <laughs> been pretty cool to see that. Consistency is rare. Let's talk bullying in training. There seems to be, to me, a lot of bro culture around working out. And it seems to have some of the same things that I rally against in the self-defense space, which I call the lions and tigers and bears effect, which is alpha beast mode kill anything that comes near you and all this like really the word toxics overused but really unproductive ways to use energy what are your thoughts on that i've found that ego gets in the way often mm. the toughest thing that we can do in our career is take ownership over where we have to develop ourselves i was thinking about this this morning because i'm working with like an online client who is having a lot of trouble getting buy-in like a reason to pay attention to her nutrition and a reason to pay attention to her mm -hmm. fitness. And I was thinking to myself, I was like, okay, like what's happening here? And for a moment I was thinking like, maybe she's just not like listening. Then I quickly understood that it, I have more to learn as a coach. I need to bring myself up to the level that they are at to meet them where they are at in order to be the coach that they need. And what I find within the industry, that's like the toughest truth to settle in with where a lot of people are not like, speaking directly to trainers and coaches, when we are the most negative to our colleagues, we're struggling to accept that there are things that we need to work on. It's not bad to have a list of things to work on. It's not bad to have to work on your speaking skills or to have to work on like how you speak to people with empathy and being able to listen and to be able to hear like vocal cues, to be able to see like physical indicators of like, has this person had enough sleep? even if they told you they've had enough, like all these different nuances, we can level up to that. But if we are not open to that, we're looking for somebody to blame. One person's busier than the other. Or one person's getting recognized for something the other one is. And it's like, that's their fault. And that's an easy way out. I think it probably pops up in all kinds of different industries and environments. Yeah. What I find is that the more self-aware you are, and it certainly does not make the career path any easier, but the more self-aware that you are, the more lumps you're willing to take, the more you're willing to accept that you still have work to do, no matter how much skin you've had to put into the game, the easier it is to ascend through the industry. And right. I used to like totally doubt myself when I said that, but I've, I've seen how it's worked for my own career. And it's certainly like, you just really have to check yourself frequently right. and people are going to give you feedback that you're just not going to like at all. They're going to give you feedback that are going to, it's going to impact your finances. But if you can like take ownership of that, the moves that you're going to make and the people that are, you're going to gravitate towards you and the opportunities that you're going to have, because if you are open enough to understand that 
even though you've reached a level that you're proud of, you still have work to do. Other people are going to trust you with their business. And that's probably why I'm in the position that I'm in. And I mean, that is by no means to be like boastful. It's just simply just kind of painting the picture of if somebody else wanted to get there, they'd have to be pretty comfortable with understanding that when people say they have something to work on, Mm -hmm. they have something to work on. I think there's a lot of parallels between what you do and what I do. And one of the things that I say obnoxiously a lot is self-defense is deeply personal, which means everybody's gonna have different goals. Like why my daughter takes a self-defense class is gonna be different than why my uncle takes a self-defense class and be different than why my boss does. I'm assuming you see the same thing in training because from what I'm hearing, and obviously correct me if I'm wrong, from what I'm hearing, you take a very client driven approach as opposed to a, I am the expert, do as I say, you tend to listen to the clients and then move them forward. That's the angle I take with this. And I've seen big success. Is that a correct assessment? Yeah, absolutely. Like that's kind of, I look at it from the angle that my clients don't owe me anything. Like, it's not like just because I'm a trainer means that they have to work with me. I need to figure out where my value lies in our interaction. And it's going to be very different from person to person. And it has the ability to evolve at any rate that it may. I can't expect that this human being that I'm working with is going to show up the exact same way week after week, or that their life is going to be the same, or that their finances are going to be the same, or right. their family structure is the same. So I have to be constantly open to how change looks like and how I can meet that. And so that influences continuing education that I seek out. It influences the guests that I reach out to and it influences what times I book people. I book people at quieter times at the gym so that they can have a better experience. Not so that I can get like a certain time off, but so that they are getting the experience that they need in order to be successful. So what do you think the benefits of physical training are to self-defense? We kind of talked about a little bit pre-show with physical resiliency. And I have obviously my own view on this. I have my own view on all of this stuff. How important do you think physical fitness is for protection, for deterrence, all that kind of stuff? So it's kind of cool how we can look at this through a like a zoomed out lens because oftentimes fitness isn't the final show. It's not the final frontier. You'll see a lot of really jacked looking people that are really struggling with self-awareness. And then you see that they're struggling with self-awareness and you're wondering, okay, like how are they going to apply all this strength and they struggle. And so then to circle back to strength, like you need to have both items in check. And so the same goes for physical fitness tied into self-defense, right? A person could be like super strong and look capable of like holding their ground and standing up for themselves and having good boundaries. But sometimes people who look like they could defend themselves is not quite the case. It could be because of like a toxic situation going on. It could be communication style. It could be that they are setting themselves in situations either to be underestimated, like psychologically or to be taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. So I would say there is so much nuance into that correlation because you can take a very self-aware person and teach them how to be incredibly safe without biasing strength to a degree that it's like something that they're known for. They don't have to be the strongest looking person in the room to be the safest looking person in the room. And you can take the strongest looking person in the room and they might have a lot to work on before they are the safest person in the room. I see that it's it's kind of like a all encompassing sort of situation where there's always going to be work to do and it will almost be deceptive Mm-hmm. as to what the outcomes are. You might be surprised as to who has what outcomes. And I've learned to never judge a book by its cover and to just always listen for cues right. and observe. What I'm hearing is the the outward appearance or the perceived things that they have succeeded at might not necessarily transfer directly to a protection situation. And we see this all the time with the meme culture loves like this guy, like skinny looking BJJ, triple world black belt is 
stronger than this guy, which is like this jacked up bodybuilder. I'm never going to say don't get healthier. Don't get, I'm running stairs right after this, right? So I'm never saying don't get healthier. Don't get stronger. Things are easier when you're stronger and stronger people are just harder to kill. And I mean that in general, including heart disease and all other regions of your life. But when it comes to self-defense, I like to, I compare self-defense to water safety training quite a bit. The Sometimes the strongest swimmers take the highest risks and go into the most dangerous water. Some people get super fit and they have all this strength and physical resiliency. They might start seeking out issues to test themselves. As you've talked about ego, this is where that untested, unchecked ego becomes a problem. I've seen lots of fighters do the same thing where they get into bar fights, lose contracts because they still have this thing inside that's questioning themselves, right? That imposter syndrome that pops up. What are your thoughts on that? So when I think about that, the first thing that comes to mind is oftentimes just like competitive lifters, right? So like in the powerlifting community and a person gets into the space where they almost feel like they're a superhero, right. but then they they feel that way to the extent where they're willing to sacrifice the next 30 years of their life by like taking on all these injuries and stuff. And there's a lot of situations where you can balance that out like with good, like kind of risk management, uh, with good right. programming in which you can perform at a high level and not run the risk of injury. But it's so rare to find that balance that a lot of people would have a net benefit for focusing on dialing it back despite what their full potential is. Dialing it back on an internal perspective is going to look much more like significant than from an external perspective. Like if I lift as much as I possibly can, it would, people would be, oh yeah, no, that's impressive. And I'm not saying that I'm lifting more than my colleagues. I'm just saying like me relative to strength in general. And then if I lifted as much as what would be reasonable, other people would still be impressed. Like right. that little like variance isn't going to matter. And so mm -hmm. if we take like a strong person in a situation where they're going to have to like show how strong they are, if they show just a little layer of strength that they're setting boundaries or they're communicating clearly, right? people are going to still see them as a strong person. If they overshoot it to something they're capable of, they probably won't die. Somebody probably won't kill them. It's not going to be worth it to show up in that way for the risk that they're running. From an external perspective and how people describe that person, it'd be a similar description, both in where they are just uh, verbally defending themselves mm -hmm. versus physically defending themselves. So I have the type of body that if I look at a cake, I gain five pounds. Like I just have that. I put on muscle and mass very easily. I have what most people would consider a power lifter type body. It's just very easy for me to lift heavy things and get big. And I remember doing it. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to embrace my body. Screw this martial arts thing. Screw this cardio. I'm just going to lift heavy things. And honestly, Chris, I can't stress enough. I felt amazing in the gym lifting heavy things, but the rest of my life was trash. Like I could lift, like I was deadlifting a whole bunch. I felt like a superhero for an hour a day and for 23 hours, sleep apnea, like just all these issues. So I went up to 295 pounds. I'm not a small fella, but that's like 40, that's 40 pounds heavier than I'm right now. And I'm still pretty heavy. And I just, I remember like, I thought that this, this would be like the fitness journey for me, but it just didn't work out for me personally and my goals, which is the most important. Why are you doing this? Like you mentioned your client, right? They need, they needed the why they needed the, why am I doing this? Why am I sacrificing? Cause there's going to be a little sacrifice, right? Why am I, what's the purpose of this. That leads me to the mental side of this. And what I believe honestly is one of the most important factors of training is the mental resilience you build to get up and go to the gym and to continue and to say no to that piece of cake when you want to say no to that cake. It's super important. I've been doing the Wim Hof thing recently for the last like three weeks. So the first week of cold showers was awful. And now I love it. I love it. But I'm also a chubby Canadian. So, you know, me and cold are okay. But I love and I love it. And honestly, now I feel like a superhero when I'm done my three minute cold shower. Cause I'm like, I did the hard thing. Right. So can you speak to that? Like the benefits of the mental resiliency, just kind of in general. One thing that I've learned and I especially learned this through pandemic mm -hmm. was how important it is to kind of have like that sense of community or connection right, intertwined right. within our uh, physical goals. Because like as an observer within a gym, I have seen people be incredibly disciplined towards their fitness. Like they got the horse blinders on they're in like seven days a week sometimes twice right. a day these people do not struggle with motivation but if they are not balanced out with it all i've seen so many instances where just 
falls off the rails or all of a sudden you see that they were struggling to a point where they made a point to tell other people about it. Like if you see like the vulnerability posts and all these things, and I have a great deal of respect for those moments because oftentimes these individuals who are sharing that with the world are extremely genuine people. But essentially what I'm trying to get at here is what I have learned is like the value of having like mentors, both like just through any modality you choose, whether you're like paying for a mentorship or you have like an older relative or an older sibling or somebody at your workspace or a buddy on Instagram, like that stuff is so important because within the resiliency that strength training provides us is not going to be there for us on those tough days when we experience loss or when we experience unexplainable isolation. But if you are fostering extremely strong connections with like your circle of mentors or just your peers, then that's what's going to help you bounce back. And they're going to be like another perspective to see like how you are approaching strength. Oftentimes we kind of get stuck in our bias and we're thinking about like, I'm going to lift as much as possible. And we lift to a fault in which then all of a sudden the rest of our lifestyle suffers because we're biasing a certain lift or we're kind of like, we've got ourselves a little bit contorted because all we're doing is deadlift. We're not not right. doing anything like we're not balancing it with squats or like a push pull balance sort of thing right. and that that happens with the most talented trainers in the industry because none of us are perfect right and we're all going to kind of sway in a way that we're kind of the, the path of least resistance and so by having these connections in which somebody else has a they just want to see you win they are going to position themselves in your life in such a way that you are able to continue to build resilience through your strength training in a way that you're less likely to fall off track because it's not just you by yourself anymore. So as someone who has personally gone and pursued fitness, just like me against the world, just me horse blinders on, I don't need anybody else. Where I had the biggest turning point was when I connected with like life-changing mentors or just connecting with people that cared, people that wanted to see me survive in the industry, people who were willing willing to set me up with uh, learning opportunities, resources, willing to give me feedback that helped me with my career. So that would be, I would say that just got to have that layer of the people as right, part right. of that role, or else it's just going to be a train wreck. I can't agree with you enough. That's why I like this show. One of the biggest things I try to tell people is good self-defense training is good life skills. And having a strong community, especially in a crisis like you're talking about, is going to help give you resources. I remember we lost our house in 2000. 19 to a fire. Everything, we lost everything. And I'm very lucky to have such a group of people that helped us out. We got money from people faster than the insurance company did. The insurance company was not slow. Like I'm very blessed with the community I fostered. And that is the key. You've hit both of the things that I talk about in self-defense, but from a training angle, which is know your boundaries and limits and have a good sense of community. And the studies have shown the odds of you getting selected for something not great happening are much lower if you have strong boundaries and a good sense of community. There's just, there's so much in that. And this is why self-defense training is not just kicking and punching and choking. This is why the proactive stuff's important because if you, wherever you learn this stuff, if you learn it in the gym, if you learn it from a course with me, if you learn it from your parents, these skills will help you stay ahead of the curve of violence and not get crushed under it. It will make sure that those things don't happen. Nothing's hundred percent, but it is very beneficial. So I love hearing other experts in their field talk about this stuff because it's just such a, I don't want to say universal truth because that sounds so epic, but it's such a commonality between all things that if you have a good sense of community and you know your limits, the odds of you getting taken advantage of get dropped. The odds of you getting injured get dropped. Because I used to be competitive in martial arts. I've hurt myself stupidly every time. And it's always that, oh, I'll just do one more. I don't know if I told you this story, but I did parkour. Not a parkour bod, but I was like, I'm like Chris farley E. I I can do cartwheels and stuff, right? So I have like this ability to move around. And I went to a gym after a 40-hour training course. And it was 40 hours of training and then equal amounts of drinking and energy drinks to survive. And then I went to this parkour gym and I was done, but there's only one more move we had to do. And then the class was over and I didn't want to wimp out. Right. And I, I teach a boundary setting course, not back then. And I did a safe, the, the move is called the safety jump. I did a safety jump and I 
blew my Achilles tendon out and had to have surgery. It's still not hundred percent. So just wherever you can learn these things, like, and this is why I hate how special people make martial arts training because you can learn these lessons in other places. If you find people like Chris, people that understand what they're trying to accomplish. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, no, no problem, man. Like I said, I have one trainer on this show. I really do like your stuff. I wasn't just pumping your tires. So we're going to end the free show here. Let's tell the listeners where they can find you. The easiest way to track me down is on Instagram at Christian Little. From there, you'll be able to find my website and any other things that I'm up to. So that's an easy way to, to find me. Awesome. So if you're looking for any kind of training, does online training, you can go ahead if you like his style. Uh, I know not everybody will respond to it, obviously, but there's a lot of people, especially in my market, that I think would do very well to train with somebody, either Chris or somebody similar to Chris, because picking up what I'm putting down, you're probably going to enjoy his style as well. For me, don't forget European tour September. That is happening. We'll be in five countries. All of it's on the website. I don't want to talk too much about it. And don't forget, we have one more segment with Chris, but that's behind a paywall. So if you want to hear Chris's one up story, the story he tells the table, be the coolest person in the room, jump onto my Patreon, patreon.com slash Randy King live at the lowest level, five bucks. You get all the bonus content from all of my shows. This one, also all the devil's advocates, also all the old talking savage episodes are there. So if you want to listen to me for probably more hours than you should, that option is there on that level of Patreon. So Chris, thank you so much for your time. Please like him, share, support, jump on his Instagram. If you don't see him, he's tagged me recently. He'll be sharing the show, hopefully. So follow me at Randy King Live and you'll find Chris there. Also, don't forget my daughter will yell at me at Defense Talks with Dad on TikTok. If you guys want to see my daughter ask me questions and make fun of me every like third or fourth video. For sure, that's what the trends are right now is her making fun of my camera work, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the show. Join us on Patreon. If you can't, we will see you next week.